So I had a little excitement getting here uh, this, this afternoon. Uh, but, uh, but everything worked out in the end, and I'm glad I was able to be here. And uh, yeah, um, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, uh, my experiences among the creationists. And uh, I got to tell you, this is not anything uh, I ever imagined myself doing. Uh, I'm a mathematician uh, by training, and uh, you know, when you're learning math, uh, evolution and creationism and science and religion, uh, these, these are not topics that come up in your, <laughs> you know, in your classes. Math, uh, mercifully, is uh, you know, reasonably free from uh, you know, religious interference of, uh, uh, of any sort. Math is math, right? And uh, in fact, I actually uh, uh, I met a math professor from Liberty University. Uh, some of you probably know Liberty University, that's Jerry Falwell's outfit, not, not far from where I live. Uh, I, I live in uh, northwestern Virginia. And, uh, and I was chatting with him, and uh, I asked him what it was like being a mathematician at Liberty University. And he mentioned to me, he said, well, you know, uh, you know uh, usually over the summer, before the start of the academic year, all the, uh, you know, all the entire faculty at the small school, so the entire faculty kind of gets together, uh, and they all um, uh, come to some agreement about how they are going to integrate the faith mission of the school, uh, I remember this is Jerry Falwell's uh, school, so we're talking serious faith here, and uh, uh, how they're going to integrate that into their curriculum. And in many cases, that's obvious, of course. Uh, in the biology department, they teach young earth creationism, period. And uh, in the history department, uh, you know, they teach you know, all sorts of delightful uh, theories, uh, United States and the nation uniquely blessed by God and all that sort of thing. Uh, so, uh, so I asked him, so how, well, how, does, you know, how do you integrate the math curriculum into this? And he says, we don't. He says, uh, the math department just flies under the radar and uh, not, you know, says, says no one else in the school really understands what they do anyway. And, you know, you know, they, they want to be taken seriously, so you need a math department, but otherwise, you know, so. And interestingly enough, uh, uh, unrelated, I, I met a mathematician from uh, Brigham Young University uh, once. Uh, Brigham Young, which is actually, you know, ha, you know, has some pretty good departments, and their math department is one of them. And uh, this particular professor was Jewish. And uh, uh, yeah, so we asked him, like, you know, what, what is it like to teach at Brigham Young? He said exactly the same thing. He said, uh, uh, very few of the mathematicians uh, are actually Jewish, and, uh, uh, and that there are plenty of you know, non-Mormons in the department. It's just sort of, you know, you know, they don't bother the school, the school doesn't bother them, and uh, you know, that, that's the way it works out. Uh, but anyway, the way I got into this was um, uh, in 2000, I finished graduate school. I was at Dartmouth College, finished graduate school in math, and I got a job. And the job was at, uh, you know, being a mathematician is a little like acting, right? You're just happy to be working, right? So, uh, uh, you know, I, I got this job at Kansas State University, right? I was like, I'll take it, right? Flew out to Kansas, and uh, right at that time, maybe you remember what was going on in Kansas in 2000. Uh, they, had, uh, they had just elected a new very right-wing school board that's right-wing by Kansas standards, okay? So this is seriously right-wing. And, uh, and of course, uh, you know, they did what right-wing school boards do, which is they immediately wrote uh, evolution and the Big Bang and you know, th theories like that out of, the, uh, out of the curriculum. And this became a national sensation. Uh, you know, and, you know, everyone was kind of dumping on Kansas with you know, some justification, I would say. And uh, anyway, and that was just when I got there. And my job was actually uh, revolved around math education. Uh, so I was constantly coming into contact with public school teachers in math and science. Uh, you know, in this in the state, and that was kind of my introduction, uh, you know, to this issue. These were the people who were actually on uh, the front line of this battle, uh, you know, where they had to. You know, these were the people who had to actually implement the standards and teach their kids, uh, and uh, I teach their students, I should say. And, uh, and what ended up happening was, um, I found out about a about a conference for homeschoolers uh, that was taking place in Wichita. So these are the people who teach their kids, uh, you know, at home. And I should mention, you know, the homeschooling community very roughly can be divided into two categories. Uh, there's the religious homeschoolers, which tend to be the ones who get all the press. Uh, but then there's also people who homeschool for reasons having nothing to do with religion. And uh, I should emphasize that this particular conference was the religious homeschoolers, okay? And, uh, and it showed, and all the keynote speakers, all the featured speakers at the conference were hardcore young earth creationists. And it was a very surreal experience for me, right? Because, you know, on the one hand, you'll see some guy, some guy will get up there and he'll, he'll give a lecture on geology. You know, or some technical subject, and I'll start giving some really intricate, uh, you know, talk about you know geology and very jargon filled, and then periodically, you know, uh, someone in the, the audience will yell out, "Amen" or "Praise Jesus," <laughs> and you're like, "It's very jarring, right? Is this a science lecture or, or what's going on?" And uh, so yeah, you get this very weird mix of science and revival, you know, all at the same place, uh, because uh, you know the, the creationists they're they're very good at, at slinging jargon. Right, they'll, they'll sound very scientific, especially when speaking to an audience of people who are not themselves scientists and who are not going to have any training in these areas. Uh, so, uh, uh, like I've been to creationist lectures where they talk about mathematics a lot, and this is, this is my subject. 
And uh, so you, know, you listen to them blather on about probability and information theory and subjects like that, and they speak with absolute confidence. And, you know, and if you know these subjects, you're sitting there thinking, this is madness. This is the, my, my, my students wouldn't make mistakes like this. And, and believe me, they will make some mistakes. Uh, but, uh, uh, but meanwhile, everyone's cheering and saying, oh, this is great, this is wonderful, this is so good. Because I mean, there's nothing easier in life than, than fooling people with mathematics. Uh, I know, I mean, I do it to my students all the time, and that's what I'm trying to be as clear as possible, right? So, uh, so yeah, it was quite a trippy experience, and uh, that was my first case, and what ended up happening, I just, uh, you know, I would converse with, uh, you know, people, because this was just totally foreign to me, um, both uh, evangel you know, the world of evangelical Protestantism, to begin with, and also the world of creationism, these were just not the people I usually hang around with. So I got kind of interested in it, and I, you know, I would go to conferences like that first one I mentioned, and then numerous others. And I would always talk to the people, uh, you know, the, the, the conference goers, and uh, I would I would ask challenging questions during Q and A period, the kind of questions I would never heckle anyone or interrupt anyone, uh, but I would ask questions that would leave no doubts about where I stood <laughs> on these issues. And uh, people were often very curious afterwards. They would come up to me afterwards and ask me questions. And uh, and I did this anyway for a while, about uh, seven or eight years. And most of my friends thought I was out of my mind. So I would say, oh, I'm going away for the weekend. I'm going to be at a creationist conference. <laughs> like, you know. So, uh, but we all have our hobbies, right? And, uh, and anyway, after doing this for a few years, I decided I had enough anecdotes and enough stories and enough experience with this that I felt I had something to say. Uh, and that's where, the, that's where the book came from. And um, you know, uh, what I tried to do in the book was just talk a little bit about uh, the kind of people I met and what really motivates them. Like, why are they so hostile to, to evolution? Because I think the story is a little more complicated than, than is often presented. Uh, there are a lot of books that are you know, hostile to creationism and pro-evolution, and, and I would be happy to recommend a lot of them to you when they're very good books. But when they get to the part where they, you know, when they, when they stop talking about the science and start talking about the sociology of it, uh, I found that they may be a little, you know, they go a little overboard in the derision. Uh, and uh, I'm, all, you know, you know, I'm perfectly happy to criticize their views, uh, but I think there's a, little, there, there's a little more nuance to what they believe than, than is often presented. Uh, so anyway, that's what I'll, I'll do here. And anyway, in the next uh, you know, uh, 30 to 40 minutes or so, uh, I want to show you a little bit about what kinds of things creationists say, talk a little bit about what evolution actually says, uh, because I think that's a big part of the problem. A lot of people are just, a lot, a lot of people just have weird ideas about what evolution actually says. Uh, they picture dogs turning into cats or you know, something like that. And uh, so let's clear that up. And, uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about what are the conflicts between religion and evolution. Uh, you know, can you reconcile evolution and Christianity? Would you want to? And, uh, uh, and I think uh, you know, there, uh, the main thing I would emphasize is that there's more going on here than just uh, one weird interpretation of the Bible. Right? I mean, the, you know, the Bible is an issue, uh, but it is not the issue. Let me put it this way. If they generally liked evolution, if they thought evolution was a neat idea that was kind of flattering for whatever reason, they would suddenly discover that the Bible had been teaching that all along. Okay? Uh -huh. So uh, yeah, they start off hating evolution, and then the fact that the Bible, in their view, condemns it is just you know, great. Right? You know, so, uh, so anyway, that's uh, basically the setup. So let me start with, uh, uh, yeah, here we go, uh, a couple of uh, excerpts. Um, then, you know, yeah, this is uh, from Ken Ham's uh, very subtly uh, titled book there, uh, <laughs> The Law of Evolution. Uh, I first read this book when uh, my brother, uh, thinking he was being funny, uh, gave me a copy as a Hanukkah present. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, Ken Ham, he, he, is, he might be one of the most famous creationists uh, in the United States right now. If you've heard of the Creation Museum in uh, Kentucky, that, that's his operation. Uh, they're trying to build the Noah's Ark Park. Uh, which I'm happy to report is having severe financial difficulties. So you know, maybe there is a God. And uh, you know, yeah. And uh, anyway, here's a here's a quote from the book that says, "Evolution is basically a religious philosophy. We in creation ministries are explaining to people that both creation and evolution are religious views upon which people build their particular uh, modes of uh, you know, philosophy. Uh, therefore, uh, the issue is not science versus religion, but religion versus religion. And this is a very standard uh, tagline. As far as they're concerned." Uh, evolution is just uh, synonymous with atheism or humanism or naturalism or all sorts of other isms uh, you know, that they don't like. And if you try to tell them, no, no, it's a, it's a biological theory that like, actual scientists use in their work to uh, you know, better the fate of mankind, uh, they, uh, they're not impressed. There's nothing. Uh, and uh, that'll become relevant later. Although I should point out, I always find it interesting that when they're trying to put down evolution, they call it a religion. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's kind of interesting, right? I didn't realize that was a put down. <laughs> in their view. Uh, here's another excerpt from uh, Ken Ham says that one wants to destroy Christianity to destroy the foundations of the book of Genesis. Um, now, uh, this is very standard of young earth creationism. See, creationism comes in several schools, uh, and we'll discuss a few of them. Uh, young earth creationism is probably what most people think of when they think of creationism. And they're the ones who talk most enthusiastically about the Bible. 
And, uh, and this is just a really nice, succinct uh, statement of, of how they view things. That the point is, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, you know if, if, you're, if you're willing to compromise on Genesis, which really lays down, as they see, the foundations uh, you'll, you'll have life. Uh, if you're willing to compromise on that, if you say, oh, maybe it's a metaphor, uh, or maybe it's just a, you know, a fable that teaches us uh, you know, moral lessons or you know, something like that, which many more modern Christians are perfectly happy to say, uh, they, they say, no, it's a slippery slope from that to you know, debauchery and madness and atheism and all sorts of hard, other you know, horrible things. Uh, so this is a really, uh, uh, you know, this is, you know, in a nutshell, that, that, that italicized line of bottom, every single biblical doctrine of theology, uh, directly or indirectly, openly has its basis in the book of Genesis. And if you prefer it in uh, picture form, uh, here's a cartoon they're very fond of. Uh, there is the uh, Odyssey of Evolution, uh, just in case you were uh, confused about the source of evolution, right? <laughs> Yeah, you know, very clear there. Evolution is the same. Creation is the price. And uh, I, I don't know if you, and maybe those bubbles, or those balloons up there are a little hard to read. They say things like abortion, uh, racism, uh, actually, I can't read them. <laughs> abortion, uh, racism, uh, homosexuality, euthanasia, divorce, pornography. And uh, and if you're thinking, well, this is this is this is ludicrous. Uh, but yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I'm pretty sure prostitution, for example, uh, came before uh, evolution, right? It is in the Bible, right? It's the old, it's the world's oldest profession. Right, and uh, so if you're inclined to point out, say, well, this this is ridiculous. I mean, you know, how can you possibly bl blame evolution for any of these things uh, when clearly they all predated evolution? They'll say you're just confused. You think evolution is some scientific theory that Darwin came up with in 1859, but more savvy people know that really evolution is just synonymous with any worldview that rejects God. And when you reject God, uh, badness occurs, uh, and uh, or at least what they consider bad. I mean, yeah, uh, you know, I don't think I would. Yeah. If evolution wants to take the blame for homosexuality, I'm okay with that. Right? Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean they have a certain you know, uh, like you know, you know, racism goes right alongside homosexuality. So I, I don't know about that one. Uh, but anyway, that's how they see it. Uh, so I mean, and, well, you know, th this actually already goes a long way to explaining some of their vitriol, uh, in that uh, evolution is just synonymous with all things bad, uh, and. Uh, uh, yeah, that's, and, if, and if you say to them, no, uh, evolution is actually a scientific theory, uh, that reflects a misunderstanding. That, you know, that reflects badly on your understanding, right? You're the one who's confused, and they, they'll shake their head sadly at you. Um, so anyway, that's Ken Ham uh, as another representative. So, so Ken Ham is basically a preacher. I mean, he has no scientific credentials at all. And when he talks, he's basically a preacher. Uh, and like a lot of preachers, he's, he's, he, he, you know, he can be very compelling. Uh, you know, when, you're, when you, you see him speak, especially if he's speaking to a sympathetic audience, uh, you get you get caught up in it because he speaks with absolute confidence, and uh, you know you, you, it's very easy when everyone's cheering him, right? And you're the other one sitting there. You get caught up in it. And you're like, yeah, I wish those mean old scientists would leave him alone, right? And you know, uh, and then you get back, you know, get some fresh air, and get in the car, and you go, whoa, you know, what was that about? Uh, now this fellow, uh, Hank Hanegraaff, uh, he has a, uh, a radio show called uh, The Bible Answer Man, uh, which uh, streams online, which I love listening to. Uh, you know, he, he's out of his mind, but it's, 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 <laughs> and yeah, you know, that and yeah, it's an interesting show. Uh, he is technically what is known as an older creationist, uh, which means uh, he's okay with the idea that that the the, you know, the Earth and, uh, and the universe is, is billions of years old. Uh, he's okay with that, but evolution is still nonsense. Uh, but anyway, he wrote a book, and it's called uh, maybe you can't quite make out the title. The face uh, that demonstrates the parts of evolution, and that's an acronym. Face. That's F period, A period, C period, E period. Let's see what FACE stands for, because uh, Mr. Hanegraaff fancies himself a scientist. Uh, so uh, let's see what we have here. It says, the F in FACE will serve to remind us that the fossil record is an embarrassment to evolution. It demonstrates in spades that transitional forms from one species to another are purely mythological. Uh, and uh, you can't call the general public seems blithely unaware of the fact that transitions from one species to another do not exist. It's common knowledge among paleontologists. <laughs> this is a really good, typical uh, sample of what creationism is like. Uh, you know, entirely uh, bold, confident statements, uh, you know, where they're constantly reminding you who the good guys are and who the bad guys are, and it's utter nonsense, right? I mean, it's just, it takes a, it takes a really shameless person, uh, you know, to write this nonsense. It's, like, it's common knowledge among paleontologists that transition from one species to another time like this. You know, the fossil record, you know, if the fossil record were really this colossal embarrassment, you know, to evolution, uh, you know, I think a few paleontologists would have noticed this uh, by now. Uh, and basically, uh, you know, I mean, uh, transitional forms, you know, fossils that show, you know, traits of, you know, one, you know, class of animals, uh, one, you know, you know tr tr uh, 
Fossils that show traits transitional between an earlier uh, form, animal form and a later one are really quite numerous. Uh, you know, in the fossil record, you can pick up any textbook on paleontology if you want. Uh, what he's alluding to there is that uh, the idea of you know insensibly graded uh, fossil series of the sort that Darwin talked about that is quite rare. But that's a very different thing from saying the fossil record is an embarrassment or the fossil record doesn't have any transitional forms. So this is you know, you know for you know, all the confidence you know, that he speaks with. Uh, this is this is you know pure blarney, and uh, let's see what the A is. Uh, a represents eight men pictures of water candy. By the way, uh, don't learn your science from acronyms. Okay, I mean, you know, it, like it's already a bad. If you're, I mean, if your book is called "The Face That Demonstrates the Horse of Evolution," you probably know. Sometimes you can judge a book by its cover, and uh, you know if you you know if you have some experience reading science, you kind of know what the real thing looks like. And, uh, and then th this isn't it. Uh, but anyway, it says, uh, A represents eight men fiction, fraud, or fantasy. As you proceed, you will, uh, uh, well, got that right. You will discover that uh, the Pantropus erectus, uh, fictitious, Piltdown Man was a fraud, and Peking Man is pure fantasy. Uh, Piltdown Man was a fraud. He, he did get that right. Of course, it was a fraud exposed by other scientists, and it was exposed uh, precisely because it did not fit uh, with uh, other advances in evolutionary biology. Pilt Piltdown Man was a fossil that was discovered uh, you know, like around 1912, I think it was. That, that's the ballpark. And uh, and it basically had, uh, you know, uh, you know, it was basically a skull that had certain, uh, or a, a, a skeleton that had certain ape-like features or certain human-like features. And uh, and for about the next, uh, you know, 40 years or so, uh, it was accepted as a legitimate fossil. And then in the early 1950s, it was exposed as, as a fraud. But on what basis was it exposed as a fraud? Right? It was exposed as a fraud because, uh, you know, uh, other progress in evolutionary biology showed that the precise combination of features that Piltdown had did not fit. I mean, yeah, it had some ape features and had some human features, but it was the wrong constellation of features. And that's what prompted people to go back and look at it again. Well, you might say, if it was a fraud, why wasn't it caught sooner? Well, you have to remember, first, in 1912, we didn't have radiometric dating methods, which would have exposed the fraud immediately. Uh, they really didn't have reliable ways of dating fossils, uh, you know, or at least not in an absolute way uh, at, at that time. And there was also the fact that paleontology was sort of barely a science at that time. Uh, you know, paleontology was not considered a serious enterprise. You know, you know, people would go and take up fossils and write little papers describing the fossils, but it wasn't like a theoretical science the way it is today. Uh, nowadays, there's all sorts of mathematics, computer science, all sorts of fancy things. Uh, you know, they get brought to bear on it. Uh, but then it was just sort of everyone said, uh, you know, I mean, the scientific community was already convinced of evolution for other reasons, and so someone said, hey, I dug up this fossil here that shows some ape features and some human features, and everyone said, okay, that's nice, uh, and then kind of moved on. Uh, and that's how it survived for as long as it did. Uh, a more recent fraud involving certain bird fossils uh, was exposed almost immediately. Uh, you know, it's because you know, it's, it's gotten harder to, you know, to defraud people these days. So this idea that, you know, they, I mean, creationists still talk about Piltdown Man, you know, you know decades later. Um, and the fact is, the, you know, the, the, the record of uh, you know, hominid fossils, you know, you know, fossils linking uh, ancient hominids to modern humans, is unbelievably complete. I mean, there are so many fossils that if, if every single one of them is a fraud, all I can say is, uh, you know, uh, you know, bravo. I mean, you know, to, to, to pull off a conspiracy of this magnitude is very, very impressive. So to just say, oh, ape man, fiction, fraud, fantasy, well, one of us is talking about fantasy, but uh, I don't think it's the scientist. Uh, okay, so C stands for chance. Ooh, this gets into my line of work. This is probability theory and mathematics. He says, imagine asserting that the majestic Messiah composed itself part of the handle. Uh, and uh, yeah, then I and Agon or the Earth. Uh, each of its vast complexity came into existence by blind chance. Well, this is childish, right? Because uh, you know, evolution is not a theory of blind chance. Of course, that would be absurd uh, to suggest that something very complicated like that can just poof into existence by chance. Um, but it is not at all absurd to say that something like that could evolve gradually by very small incremental steps uh, under the auspices of natural selection. Natural selection is not a random process. Uh, and that's so kind of, you kind of missed uh, you know, a fairly big part of the theory. I can't wait to see what he is. Uh, and, uh, and E represents empirical science. Uh, yeah, so on the law of energy conservation is a blow to the guy. I mean, just love it. I mean, you know, he never lets up, right? You know, every sense is so enthusiastic. Uh, blow the law of entropy is a bullet to its head, right? And uh, yeah, and he goes on to talk about the second law of thermodynamics. Now, this is one of those things. Uh, it can sound, you know, if you stand up in front of an audience of people uh, who have never heard of the laws of thermodynamics, and you say, you know, and you start talking about entropy and heat engines and talking about you know, evolution contra contradicting the second law, you sound really smart, okay? But it's just complete nonsense. Anyone who actually knows anything about the second law of thermodynamics uh, you know, understands that the, the, the second law uh, only applies to a closed system. So the, the second law of thermodynamics says that things, uh, you know, that, you know, that how should I put this? Uh, 
uh, it says that basically an isolated system uh, will tend to uh, you know, in, you know, move towards uh, you know, maximum entropy, which very roughly uh, is, you know, has to do with uh, you know, chaos and disorder. Um, but if there's energy and, and, you know, entering the system, uh, then the second law doesn't make that claim anymore. Uh, and of course, the Earth is not a, uh, it's not a closed system, right? You know, it's constantly being bathed in energy from the sun, and that's, you know, that energy fuels a lot of chemical reactions. Uh, so, uh, so, so suffice it to say, you know, the, the second law of thermodynamics just does not contradict evolution. And, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing where people had like an ounce of skepticism. You know, it's one thing to think that scientists are wrong about something, that's certainly fine. But it's another thing to think that they're stupid, uh, or that they're just incompetent. And if you start saying that this fundamental principle of science, the second law of thermodynamics, fund it, you know, it's a bullet to the head of evolution, and you're going to ask me to believe that scientists have simply overlooked this, right? You know, if you have any skeptical impulses, you should think, wait a second, let me get the other side of the story here. And again, you know, there are things about, you know, reasonable people can disagree about a lot of things, but reasonable people cannot disagree uh, over whether the second law of thermodynamics contradicts evolution. You either understand thermodynamics or you don't. And if you do understand it and you understand evolution, you understand that they don't conflict. And if you think they do, you're wrong, about a matter of fact. Uh, okay, so I'd love to, I wouldn't, you know, be perfectly happy to turn this into a, you know, a whole thermodynamics lecture, but, uh, but I do have a few more slides. So uh, let's see what comes next. Okay, so, um, so that, was, that was just sort of give you some of the flavor uh, of what creationist literature is like. Uh, you know, and this was one of the things that struck me. You know, when I first started reading this literature, remember I was a mathematician with no training in biology or paleontology or genetics or any of these things. And uh, you know, I would read all these arguments, and you know, off the top of my head, I wouldn't necessarily have an answer uh, you know, for them, uh, simply because I didn't know those subjects. But I was suspicious right from the start, simply because they were asking me to believe not just that scientists were wrong, but that they were just hopelessly incompetent in every way. And they weren't asking me to believe simply that evolution was mistaken. Uh, they were asking me to believe that it was a ludicrous idea that no reasonable person could believe. And you know, it is, whether you like it or not, it is the fact of the matter that you know, virtually all scientists you know, uh, accept this and actually use it in their work. Uh, they could be wrong, but they can't all be crazy. Okay, so I was suspicious right from the start. Uh, but anyway, here are some other uh, rhetorical tricks that they use. Uh, one of their favorites is to uh, quote people out of context. Uh, and uh, so they'll often quote people in ways that make them seem to be saying the exact opposite of what they're actually saying. Now this is uh, Theodosius of Jansky. Uh, he was not a creationist. He was uh, you know, a very prominent scientist. Uh, and he, I, I, I just love this quote, I think he describes it perfectly, that their favorite sport is stringing together quotations carefully and sometimes expertly taken out of context to show that nothing is really established or agreed upon among evolutionists. Some of my colleagues and myself have been amused and amazed to read ourselves quoted in a way showing that we are really anti evolutionists <laughs> under the skin. And uh, I often tell people that the way you can tell that you're really starting to understand evolutionary biology is when you can identify the correct context of a quotation simply from seeing how it's misused by creationists. Uh, that's when you're getting the hang of this. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's a standard uh, little rhetorical trick. Um, here's another one I'd like to do. So, so this is Phil Johnson. Now, Phil Johnson is an intelligent design proponent. Uh, this is another school of creationism. Uh, we mentioned young earth creationism and old earth creationism. Nowadays, uh, there's a lot of press about intelligent design, which is this very watered down uh, you know, form of uh, creationism uh, that uh, was an attempt, it basically was a legal strategy devised in the late 80s. You know, as, as more and more courts struck down attempts to introduce scientific creationism, uh, up popped intelligent design. Now, of course, intelligent design, uh, you know, had a bad day back in, uh, actually almost exactly, um, what, about nine years ago, I guess it was in 2005, in January, uh, when the intelligent design got its big test uh, in court, uh, and, uh, and the evolution side won. And that was a pretty conservative judge. It was George W. Bush appointing uh, the judge. And the judge laughed at them. I mean, it was, it was, I mean, it was a good day for <laughs> evolutionists, basically. Uh, but anyway, Philip Johnson is intelligent. I'm wrong. Here's the kind of thing that they write. It says, if the evolutionary scientists were better informed or more scientific in their thinking, you know, um, you know, Philip Johnson was a lawyer. I mean, he, he was a law professor, right? So it's a little nauseating to have him lecture scientists about being better informed. Um, they would be asked about the origin of information. The materialists know this at some level, but they suppress their knowledge to protect their assumptions. Now, look at some of the, you know, delicious rhetorical tricks that he used there. First of all, the evolutionary scientists of the first uh, sentence morphed into the materialists of the next, uh, which is, uh, you know, there's no necessary connection between those two ideas. Uh, and I love the casual, uh, you know, implication of, uh, of the rank dishonesty and, you know, uh, they suppress their knowledge to protect their assumptions. Just this, you know, very casual implication of, uh, of uh, intellectual dishonesty. Uh, and that's just ubiquitous. I mean, they just do this all the time. And, uh, you know, that kind of thing is usually frowned upon, uh, you know, in scientific writing. Um, you don't casually uh, question people's motives like that. Uh, 
Here's a good one, and I apologize for uh, putting so much uh, text on this one slide, but I couldn't bear to cut off this quotation. Uh, you know, anyway, it's just too wonderful. Uh, even Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock up there are impressed, I think. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, yeah, this probably should be set to music. Uh, since dogmatic Darwinists uh, begin by imposing a narrow interpretation on the evidence and declaring it to be the only way to do science, critics are then labeled unscientific. The articles are rejected by mainstream journals. The editorial boards are dominated by the dogmatists, and I'm uh, sure you can read the rest here. And uh, I like the second paragraph again, you know, says, uh, they, you know, like, this, you know, like witnesses against the mob, uh, where the evidence is buried in specialized publications. Great stuff, right? You know, uh, I think Jonathan Wells there, another intelligent design proponent, uh, was uh, having uh, having fun uh, <laughs> coming up with uh, that one. Uh, but it, it's, you know, it's, it's pure nonsense. All that's going on here is, you know, if, if I send, if I as a mathematician, if I send a paper to a math journal, and that paper argued that one plus one equals three, right, the paper's not going to get published. You know, simple as that. And that's basically what we're talking about here. Yeah, periodically an intelligent design person will send a paper off to a journal and the paper will get rejected and they'll cry oppression. But really it's just that, you know, anyone who knows what they're talking about looks at this and says, this is crazy. It would be the end of the journal if we published this. <laughs> and the fact is, for all the talk about all this, uh, you know, bigotry or all this, uh, you know, uh, mob behavior, the fact is the intelligent design folks have had no trouble getting their point of view out. Uh, they've written you know, uh, you know, any number of books, and many of those books have been reviewed in, in serious scientific uh, you know, journals. So it's not that they weren't able to get their point of view out, and it's not that scientists ignored them. It's that you know, scientists reviewed their books and explained in great detail why it was all nonsense, and, uh, and they don't like that, <laughs> right? And uh, that's all that's going on there. So, uh, so anyway, but you can understand why scientists would be a little uh, you know, uh, nonplussed uh, by, by, you know, you know, by uh, you know, creationists and uh, and you know, not plus by the thought of sharing a stage with them and having a debate. I mean, this is how they talk, right? And you know, respect is a two-way street, and I don't see much of it coming the other way. Okay, so uh, okay, so anyway, that was uh, just a quick little uh, overview of how creationists talk. Um, now uh, that said, there are a few common misconceptions of creationists that I do want to clear up. Uh, you know, that was the uh, the seamy side of creationism. There are just a few things though, uh, you know, that where I think they're often accused of things that maybe are a little unfair. Uh, and it matters because uh, you know sometimes when I hear very uh, you know uh, you know very superficial criticism of creationism, that's the kind of thing that justifies creationists in thinking everyone just have to get them. Uh, so you know I, I do endeavor to present people accurately. So here you know, first of all, you know people often say they're biblical literalists. Well, yes or no? Yeah, yes and no. I should say. Um, you know they're not literalists in the extremely crude way that people think. Uh, they have no problem with the idea that there are figures of speech and you know metaphorical writing. Uh, you know, if the Bible said it rained cats and dogs, they would not be picturing animals, you know, falling from the sky. Um, so uh, they're not literalists in that very crude sense. Uh, what they do say, though, is that you should hew to a plain reading of the Bible. So basically, if you're going to take it non-literally, there should be a really good textual reason uh, for, for doing it that way. So, for example, Jesus often taught in parables, right? And parables, of course, are fictional stories intended to make a point. But when he's giving a, when he's, you know, giving a parable, it's clearly labeled as a parable, you know, in the text. Uh, or, in, or in the book of Psalms, for example. Well, Psalms are clearly poetry, clearly a place where you, you don't expect uh, you know, literal uh, writing. Uh, but then they contrast that with the book of Genesis, and as they see it, the book of Genesis is not written that way. Uh, you know, if you compare it textually to, to other parts of the Bible and other texts at the time, uh, they say uh, there's every reason to think that it, is a, that it was intended as a historical account. So people who say, oh no, it was just a metaphor, it wasn't intended literally, uh, they say, well, there should be some good textual reason for interpreting it that way, and as they see it, uh, there simply is not. So it's not that they, they're just crudely literal. Uh, it's that they, they argue that if you are going to take it non-literally, you better have a really good reason. Uh, they, they, you know, if you tell them, well, wait, you need a degree in ancient languages, or you need to go to the local ancient history department uh, to interpret it, well, they'll say, no, that, that's ridiculous. The Bible is written for everyone. Right? I mean, the common person is supposed to be able to understand the Bible. God wouldn't communicate central truths of existence in a way so opaque that you need a PhD in something to understand it. It's ridiculous. So this idea, you know, you read a story, it sure sounds like six normal 24-hour days. Uh, this idea that actually was written in some subtle code that you need to interpret, uh, you know, through the, you know, the lens of years of graduate study, that's, that's already ridiculous in their view. Uh, okay, so that's uh, the first one. Uh, yeah, they, they do not think Genesis is a science textbook. They, what they think of Genesis is that it's a book that, as it happens, also addresses a few scientific topics. But it's not like it's primarily a science textbook to them. Uh, what they would say, no, it's primarily a, you know, a book of religious teachings and, uh, you know, and uh, uh, you know, uh, historical information, things that uh, teach us about our, our uh, sinful condition. Um, and, uh, and it just so happens that along the way they mention a few scientific topics. Uh, and, uh, and in their view, the Bible is just as authoritative 
when it talks about science is when it talks about everything else. But the fact is, very little of the Bible really says anything you know, relevant to science. I mean, the Bible is a big, dense book, and there are only a few little pieces here and there that actually run into problems with science. The first 11 chapters of Genesis having to be one, having to be, happening to be one of those uh, uh, times. But, uh, but still, so they're not just naively saying, uh, you know, let's, let's do science by reading Genesis. And um, yeah, and here's another one. Uh, you know, as, as adamant as they are that they're the ones who really understand Christianity, not like those moderate compromisers, uh, they do not say that your salvation depends on getting Genesis right. right? Your salvation within Christianity, your salvation depends on accepting the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of uh, Jesus Christ and your need for a savior and all that. Uh, and that has nothing to do with evolution. Okay, so and they're actually a little touchy on this one. Uh, actually, I've, like, I've heard a number of, like Ken Ham himself and other prominent speakers really make an issue of this. We're not saying that you can't be a Christian if you accept evolution. As they see it, evolution is just a slippery slope. Right? Once you start accepting evolution, then pretty soon uh, you know, you're compromising on other things as well. So that's why they get so adamant about it. But it's not that they actually make it a condition of your salvation. And, uh, and yeah, they get really, this one, I don't know if this one's a, a misconception or not, but I thought I would mention it. They get really upset if you suggest that uh, they, they, they practice blind faith. Uh, Christian fundamentalists talk more about logic, reason, and evidence than any people you will ever meet. Okay, uh, they're really quite impressive in that way. Uh, as, as they see it, uh, all the evidence is on their side, and all the reasonable people believe as they do, and uh, uh, and that's not a matter of faith, or at least not primarily a matter of faith. It's that just uh, any reasonable understanding of the evidence should lead you to believe what they believe. As it happens, they have a very distorted view of what that evidence is. And uh, they, they believe a lot of things that just simply are not so. So they're very badly misinformed, okay? Uh, but they're not saying, uh, you, know, uh, you know, no, uh, you know, God personally spoke to me, and that's how I know evolution is wrong. They're saying, uh, no, if you, if you understand the facts of the Bible and the, and the facts of science, everyone should believe in young earth creationism and, you know, and all the rest of it. Um, so, uh, so, they, you know, so blind faith is not the issue. Uh, being horribly misinformed and horribly insolent, like they tend only to talk to each other, uh, that's really uh, the, you know, the bigger issue. Uh, okay, uh, so let's move from there to talk about just a couple of things about you know, what evolution actually does say. Um, I, I mentioned uh, earlier some common misconceptions. Uh, I guess the first thing to point out is that uh, what, is, what evolution actually explains is how is it possible to go from a relatively simple form of life billions of years ago uh, to complex forms of life today uh, through entirely natural processes. And it does not explain the origin of life, right? It takes, it takes some simple form of life for granted and then explains what happens afterwards. Uh, the question of where life came from in the first place, obviously something you're going to think about, uh, you know, once you've learned about evolution, but the fact remains that you simply need a different theory uh, to explain that, and probably one that has more to do with chemics, uh, chemics, uh, chemistry and physics, excuse me, uh, than it does with biology. Biology is the study of life. So before life, what is there for biology to study? Uh, so, uh, so it's really a chemistry and physics problem, uh, but it is not one that has anything to do with evolution. And this is highly significant. Because uh, a lot of people have this idea that evolution is some all-encompassing worldview that explains everything from the origin of the universe to morality and everything else. And it, ju it just isn't that. I mean, you know, it, it explains how to go from simple life to complex life. And that's no small feat, okay? But it's not some all-encompassing theory of everything. Um, so, uh, all right, so that's, uh, that's old uh, Charles Darwin there. Yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, Charles Darwin is an older man there. Um, yeah. Now, I guess we should also point out that evolu evolution, just that word, means change over time. And um, so the thing that it's changing uh, is uh, relative uh, frequencies of genes and gene pools. So it's, it's frequencies of genes that evolve, gene pools that evolve. Uh, individual, animal, uh, individual uh, animals don't evolve. Right? Individual animals are born, they live, and then they die. Okay? They don't evolve. It's, it's you know, frequencies of genes uh, that evolve over time. Uh, so that's a, another one to point out. And uh, yeah, now the main mechanism uh, governing evolution is natural selection, which is superficially a very simple idea. It's just that you know when you have offspring, those offsprings vary, uh, the, you know those children vary in various ways, and sometimes some random variation uh, will confer an advantage. Maybe uh, you know uh, you know because of some uh, you know uh, you know maybe you possess some gene that allows you to run faster, you know than other uh, you know others of your kind, so you're better able to escape predators. Well, that will give you an advantage in the struggle for existence. So. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the favorable genes uh, you know, propagate and the less favorable ones uh, disappear, and that's natural selection. And uh, let's see, I, right, yeah, this is a, that's Charles Darwin and the younger man. Uh, I thought I needed a graphic to go along with this slide. And um, yeah, now here's uh, another one. The way, when you think about evolution, you should be picturing, the, the picture should be a family tree. Right, I, made a, I alluded earlier, I said, if you're picturing dogs turning into cats, uh, or if you're picturing uh, birds hatching out of lizard eggs you know, or something like that, you have the wrong idea. 
Okay, uh, I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. Um, I think a good way to picture uh, evolutionary change is this. Uh, imagine that you take, say, a newborn baby, uh, and every, let's go extreme, let's say every hour, uh, literally every 60 minutes, you take a photograph of that baby. And you do keep doing that every hour until the baby is 50 years old. Okay? So you're going to have a huge number of photographs you know, when you're done. And imagine that you line them up in a row. Well, any two consecutive photographs are going to look completely identical to each other. But they're not really identical, you know, are they? There really are these very microscopic changes. You, know, you have aged an hour, and uh, you know, that's not going to make a big difference. But there are these subtle microscopic differences. And pretty soon, so if you, so if you compare photos uh, you know, that are next to each other, they'll look identical. But if you compare photos that are a year apart, suddenly the changes are quite pronounced. And if you compare, say, photos that are five years apart, more pronounced still. And if you compare that first photo to the photo of the person when they're 50, you wouldn't even recognize them as the same person. So you have this incredibly gradual change, and yet it adds up to enormous uh, you know, change. That's the kind of thing you should be picturing when you think of evolutionary change. You shouldn't think dogs turning into cats. Uh, you should think of this grad you, you, what you should be thinking is that terms like dog and cat kind of lose their meaning over the long haul of natural history. Sort of like being a child loses its meaning, right? When you're, when you're first born, you are a child. Okay? When you're 50, you are not a child. Okay? But where in the middle there do you cross the line from not being a child anymore? There's no clear place where you cross the line. It's just that gradually child becomes a kind of a vague term that's not really so useful anymore. And that's basically what species are, according to evolution. You know, at any given moment, species, it's useful to classify animals into various species, but over time, the species barriers break down and they're not quite so useful uh, you know, as they used to be. And um, yeah, so, uh, so the whole pattern is like a family tree. Uh, just like you, know, you and a sibling uh, share a recent common ancestor with your parents, and you and a cousin share a, a more distant common ancestor with your grandparents, animals can be arranged in that kind of family tree. And uh, yeah, and I guess the other thing to mention is that complex adaptations evolve uh, very gradually. So you say, oh, something like an eye uh, or a, you know, a bird, the wing of a bird, that's a very impressive complex structure. Well, according to evolution, those don't just spring into existence. Uh, they evolve very gradually, step by step, uh, and not by chance, but through natural selection. Uh, I ran out of pictures of Charles Darwin. Uh, <laughs> that, that's a picture of my cat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's Emily, actually. Uh, yeah. I, I used to have another cat named Isaac. Uh, that was named uh, uh, was named after Isaac Asimov, uh, my favorite writer. But everyone just assumed I meant Isaac Newton, right? Uh, but uh, but okay. Uh, but anyway, that's Emily clearly in this picture. Uh, I'm sure she's thinking about how badly she wants to kill whatever it is she's staring at. <laughs> yeah, she's very cute, but she, she's a cat. She's <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, anyway. Uh, oh, yeah. So here's my favorite transitional form of all time. That's Kirk Cameron. Uh, childhood, you know, former teen heartthrob, you know, <laughs> Kirk Cameron. Uh, this was from the O'Reilly Factory, right? Which is where all sensible people go to learn their science. And uh, that is a picture, I kid you not, of a crocodile. A crocodile? A crocodile. That <laughs> crocodile, half duck. That's the head of a crocodile and the body of a duck. And I'm sure I uh, paid a lot of money to commission that picture. Uh, yeah, so if that, when, when we talk about transitional forms, if that's what you're picturing, you have the wrong idea, okay? Uh, you should not be picking, when we say uh, crocodiles and ducks have a share of common ancestor, we're not talking about some hideous half-crocodile, half-duck hybrid, okay? Um, you know, the, the, you know, the common ancestor of crocodiles and ducks, if you had it available to look at, almost certainly would not look anything like either a crocodile or a duck. Uh, for that, let's make it more extreme, something like humans and lobsters, right? Humans and lobsters share a common ancestor. Right? But if we had that common ancestor to look like, it would not look anything like either a human or a lobster. Okay? It would be some very primitive, wormy type you know, creature that you would not recognize as being a progenitor of either one of these uh, you know, animals. Uh, but this is, you know, this is on the O'Reilly Factory. Most watch this show on, you know, on cable television. And you know, O'Reilly and his bookers didn't say, gee, if we're going to talk about evolution, maybe we should get someone on who actually knows about evolution. They got Kirk Cameron you know, to talk about this. <laughs> And there is no shame at all you know, presenting this. Like, he actually knows what he's talking about. And this is the kind of thing, I mean, scientists are just face you know, when they see this. This is unbelievable. You, know, you have to be willfully ignorant you know, to think, you, know, you have to have made no attempt at all to understand what evolution is claiming to think this is plausible. And, uh, uh, and yet this is, the, this is what people hear uh, about evolution. This is what gets you on, you know, on nationwide television. Okay. So what is, uh, you know, as creationists see, what is the best evidence for creation? This is a fellow named Carl Kirby. He's a young earth creationist. And, um, uh, you know, he's someone, I've actually seen him live. I mean, I've actually had conversations with him. And I thought this was a very revealing quote. Like, why, why should we believe in creation? He says, to many of us uh, looking for that evidence to prove the Bible doesn't work that way. You use the Bible to understand the evidence. You use the Bible to understand the world we live in. And this is the part I like. Uh, because if you want to argue about the fish and the birds and the crocs 
every time they find a new bird, a new fish, a new rock, we're in an argument again. What I love about this is he makes that sound like a bad thing. Right? Basically what he's saying is, every time you get some new data, you have to reconsider the theory. Right? Like this is a weakness of science. Right? Most people consider the same strength <laughs> of science. And he's saying, you know, biblical creation is so much better, right? Because you have the truth, it's all there, right? And you don't have to question it anymore. Problem solved, right? We're done. And uh, this is just about, I think this quote really captures the difference between the way scientists think and the way creationists think. When the only reason creationists talk about science at all is that they're trying to justify something they already believe. Uh, whereas scientists are not doing that. Scientists are, as best they can, going where the evidence leads them. And I'm not saying science is a perfect logic reasoning machine, but that's the goal and that's what's rewarded you know, in, in science. Um, but anyway, I, I, as I said, I, I, I met Carl Kirby, nice enough fellow, and uh, well, that was mine, but nice enough. But it got me wondering what the best evidence for evolution is. Now, uh, I mean, there are plenty of books out there that explain the evidence of fossils, paleontology certainly. Uh, provides lots of good evidence, both uh, the overall sequence of fossils and the existence of transitional forms. That's all great stuff. There's a great book by Donald Prothero that uh, really goes into this in detail. Um, vestigial organs, uh, things like a human appendix, uh, or things like, a, maybe a simple example would be uh, snakes and whales have pelvic bones. Okay, Now, pelvic bones attach legs to torsos. That's what they do. So what are snakes and whales doing with them? Okay, They don't have legs. Okay, but suddenly they, you know, they become very understandable if you understand that they that these animals evolved from animals that did have legs, and the pelvic bones are a vestige of this earlier you know, evolutionary past, and that sort of thing is ubiquitous uh, among living creatures. They re they retain vestiges of their evolutionary history, uh, so that's a very good source of evidence. Uh, genetic comparisons, DNA comparisons, uh, you know, we, you know uh, when when people do uh, genome comparisons between. Uh, different kinds of organisms. They routinely confirm the evolutionary trees derived from anatomy and other sources of evidence. So the genetic evidence is certainly considerable. Uh, okay, uh, the embryo, that's a little uh, uh, baby elephant. Not quite baby, actually, you know, an elephant embryo. And uh, the, the embryological evidence is pretty significant. Uh, you know, and uh, if you look at the way uh, animals develop, it almost looks like, say, you know, like a you know, human being starts off with going through blood. It's first showing certain fishy features and certain reptilian features. And uh, so there's a lot of evidence just from embryological development that's very consistent with uh, evolution. And any one of these could easily be the subject uh, you know, of an entire book or an hour-long talk. But I, I would make a different point. Like when people ask me what's the best evidence for evolution, this is all good stuff. Uh, but I, would, I like to think of it in more practical terms. And, uh, you know, I mean, scientists are very practical people, right? Scientists have a job to do, and that job has nothing to do with spinning worldviews. Uh, you know, or anything like that. They have to, you know, make discoveries about, about nature. And so, as I see it, uh, you know, I look to the people who have to get these questions, you have to get the answers to these questions right, because their livelihoods depend on it. See, like I was on a radio show earlier today, uh, arguing with a creationist, and one of the points I made was that anyone can go on a radio show and say anything, right? But when energy companies, say, when they hire geologists uh, to, to find new sources of energy, they do not hire younger geologists, okay? <laughs> you, know, you know, they hire, you know, Real geologists, pardon me. Uh, and, and right, because it really matters to them. They have to get the right answer to this question. Most people, if you go your whole life thinking the Earth is very young and actually is very old, well, most people can go their whole lives and never make a bad decision uh, because they believe that. Uh, but you know, in some cases, it really matters. And those are the people I look to when I want to know what works and what doesn't. Okay? Uh, here's another example. This comes from paleontology. Neil Schumann is a very prominent paleontologist. There's a terrific book that he wrote called Fish. And, uh, and he talks about uh, this fossil that they found that bridged the gap between um, uh, you know, fish and, and land, uh, land dwelling animals. And they were, the way they found the fossil was they knew from other evidence when the transition occurred, right? And then they looked for you know, uh, you know, places around the globe that had exposed rocks of that age, okay? So, and, and sure enough, they were able to find exactly the kind of fossil they were looking, at, looking for. And that, so that's an example of how evolution in older geology uh, can be used for, for practical ends. Paleontologists can't mess around. Okay? They, ha you know, they have to get it right on these questions because there's very limited funding for these kinds of expeditions and they can't squander it. So again, paleontologists use evolution and, and you know, standard geology because it matters to them. And I can go down the list of you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, biologists and anatomists and you know, every other you know, uh, branch of science. Uh, it's not an abstract question for them. And I think that's really the central takeaway message. Uh, the, tech, you know, the scientific minutiae is fascinating. And uh, you know, I love all that stuff I had on the previous slide. It's great stuff. But if you really want to know where the truth is likely to lie, you look to the people who have to get this right, and they are uniformly evolutionists, while the creationists are sitting off to the side, heckling them, and uh, saying that uh, you know, they're, they're, they're doing it wrong. Well, you know, I'll stick with what gets results. Simple as that. Okay, so let's move into the final part of the talk. Uh, 
why is it? So why are, why are they so emotional about this? And I, I, you know, I've, I've mentioned the Bible a few times, and I certainly don't want to minimize that. I mean, that is an issue. I just don't think it's the only issue. And I'd like to mention three other issues that have come up. The first is the argument from design. This is William Paley, uh, who wrote, in, uh, uh, in, you know, wrote his book, Natural Theology, in 1802, where he gave a, a very eloquent statement of this argument. And the basic idea is simple enough. Uh, if you look at something like a pocket watch with all its gears and gizmos and whatnot, and its clear time-telling purpose, uh, you wouldn't look at that and say, oh, yeah, natural causes made that. No, it's pretty obvious that uh, you know, you know, you know, an intelligent agent designed that machine. So he would say, well, if, that, if, if it's obvious that that was, uh, was designed, how much more so for the kinds of systems you see in biology? You know, if the telescope was obviously designed, then the human eye, which is much more impressive than any telescope, must have been designed as well. And he wrote this in 1802. And, and it was a good argument in 1802, and virtually every scientist at the time accepted that as a good argument for some kind of designer. You can make abstract philosophical arguments against it. David Hume uh, famously wrote uh, against it, and he made some cogent points. But you know, I don't think he ever really refuted it, because the fact remains, like, yeah, you, know, you can argue, you can do philosophy over there, the fact remains, how do you explain these very complex systems? Now, of course, Darwin completely refuted that. Right? that this is precisely the argument Darwin refuted. He said, no, you can't have a natural, uh, you know, a natural uh, you know, evolution of these things. Um, now, uh, so, so the argument for design was killed stone dead, or, or at least in that form, uh, was killed stone dead by Darwin. Now, how big a blow is that for Christianity? Well, uh, you know, you know uh, more modern Christians might make a, a number of points. Uh, no essential Christian tenet rides on this, right? It's not like, uh, you know, whether or not you believe Jesus Christ died for your sins. That has nothing to do with evolution, right? So, or, or the argument for design. And that's a you know, reasonable point. And, uh, and you can also shift it back. Like some people will say, well, it's not the intricate design of organisms that, uh, that, that God had to do. It was the whole system of natural laws uh, in which evolution happens. That's where you find clear evidence from design. I think there's a lot to be said against that view, but I, that, that's, a, that's a different talk. Um, but okay, and, uh, and the point is, you know, the whole idea of looking for evidence for God is kind of, you're kind of missing the point, you know, as, as they would say. Now, these, these are all perfectly cogent replies, you know, as far as they go. And I can understand a Christian making any of these points. But I also understand why so many other Christians don't find this uh, attractive. And I think the reason is that uh, the argument from design is only partly about proving that God exists. It's only partly an intellectual argument. See, what Paley was going for was more than just an intellectual argument. What he was trying to do was emphasize the nearness of God in everyday life. See, you don't need a degree in science to appreciate that animals are complex and that design needs a designer. Right? These are not ideas that you need or you are, you know, a really thorough knowledge of biology to appreciate. So what he was emphasizing in his book was not simply an intellectual argument for showing that God exists. He was providing uh, you know, almost a, you know, a devotional, uh, you know, a, a way of strengthening people's faith by showing them that God is all around them in all the productions of nature. Okay? It's something any, that, that everyone can appreciate. So if you, if you make this move of saying, no, no, it's the fundamental constants of the universe or it's, uh, you know, it's the cosmological constant that where we find God's glory, that's too far removed. Yeah, even, even leaving aside the merits of the argument, and I, and I think there's a lot to be said against those arguments, but even if it were a good argument, emotionally it's not very satisfying. You know, the cosmological constant, that's something you learn about in physics classes, right? That's not something you would ever encounter. So, and that's the problem. Like, yeah, logically it's possible God superintended the evolutionary process, but can you talk yourself into that, right? I mean, a God, that, 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 a God that's so far away, that did his creating billions of years ago and then stepped back, and let you know, natural forces take over, that, that's a kind of God that's awfully far away uh, and not a kind of God that's really present in your day-to-day -day life. And that's kind of what Paley was going for. So the death of the design argument, yeah, intellectually it may not you know, kill Christianity, but it is a blow, right? It makes it just a little harder to believe. In fact, I'd say a lot harder to believe. It takes away a really good argument you know, from, from the theistic side. But that's just the beginning. We also have the problem of evil. The evolutionary process is pretty bad, <laughs> right? I mean, if you look at that with any sense of conscience or... Uh, uh, or uh, fair play, evolution is not for you. Okay, evolution says anything you do, no matter how savage, brutal, unfair, uh, if it gets your genes into the next generation, it will be rewarded. Okay, so it says you know kick them when they're down, uh, attack them when they're weak, uh, doesn't matter, savagery and brutality, whatever works for you, baby. Uh, so here's uh, David Hall and Philip Kitcher uh, are both two very prominent uh, philosophers who have written about this, and I especially like David Hall's version. Uh, whatever the God implied by evolution and the data of natural history may be like, he is not the Protestant God of waste not and whatnot. He is also not a loving God who cares about his production. He is not even the awful God portrayed in the book of Job. Uh, the God of the Galapagos is careless, wasteful, indifferent, almost diabolical. He is certainly not the sort of God to whom anyone would be inclined to pray. And I think this is a really important point, because very often you'll hear Christians say something like, well, maybe evolution is just God's way of creating. 
And I think people who make that argument just have not thought this through, okay? Because it's an exceptionally, spectacularly awful way of creating anything. It's wasteful, it's inefficient, it's very chancy. You never know what you're gonna get, right? And, uh, and it's just, and it's, you know, just brutal and savage and entails massive amounts of suffering. Okay. Now, again, you know, theistic evolutionists, people who accept evolution and Christianity, have their little counter arguments to make a response to this. And I don't want to pretend that these are simple issues that you can dismiss, uh, you know, you know, too casually. But I do think these are strong points. Uh, and uh, I don't know that theistic evolutionists have really been that convincing uh, in explaining why God would create this way when he could presumably have poofed it into existence, precisely as the Bible says he did. Right. Uh, okay. So this is another problem that we're worried about. And uh, here's another big one. Uh, that first statement comes from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Uh, God, infinitely perfect, and blessed in himself and a plan of sheer goodness, freely created man to make him share his own blessed life. So I mean, the fundamental Christian story is that human beings are the reason uh, for creation. We are the point of it all. We are the, we are the pinnacle of creation. Even if you don't accept a literal interpretation of Genesis, like even if you say it's just a metaphor, it's just meant to teach us certain theological truths, well, very clearly, one of those truths is that human beings are the, the apex of creation, right? The universe doesn't become very good until humans are created, right? You know, God, you know, in the story, God said, you know, and God saw you know, what he had created and, and, and saw that it was good, right? And then at the end, after he creates humans, he looks at everything he created and said, oh, now it's very good, okay? It's a little subtle point. Um, now, here's Stephen Jay Gould. I'm sure you know who he is. Um, Replay the tape a million times from a virgin's beginning, and I doubt that anything like Homo sapiens would ever evolve again. Now, that is a serious, big old conflict. Okay, you cannot be the pinnacle of creation intended by God and also be a chance byproduct of you know billions of years of evolution, just one more species among many, many not distinguished in any way, uh, except that we have this one peculiar adaptation that allows us to reason a little better uh, you know, than other animals. Yeah, so it's very hard to see how these both can be true. It's very hard to see how these can be two sides of the same point. Uh, again, there are counter arguments to be made. Uh, I won't go into that because I have, uh, oh yeah, here's just a quick review. Uh, so, so in answer to my question, what is it about evolution that, that, that you know, religious people find so objectionable? Well, it does challenge the claims of the Bible. Let's not ignore that one. Uh, it refutes the argument from design. Uh, it exacerbates the problem of evil. Uh, and, uh, and it really calls into question uh, humanity's role uh, in, in creation. And uh, you know, any one of those, maybe you can come up with a counter argument to argue it away. All four of them together are a pretty strong cumulative case. Okay? Um, and uh, so, so there you go. I mean, that's why they're so upset. Now, uh, to wrap this up, oh, sorry, I, I forgot I had this quote, too. Uh, this is uh, Charles Hodge, uh, who wrote uh, in the late 1800s. Says, we have arrived in the answer to our question, what is Darwinism? It is atheism. I do admire clear writing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, uh, so I like this nice, blunt statements like that. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but if you read that very carefully, really what he's saying, it's not so much common descent uh, of organisms that's, uh, you know, that, that's atheism. It's the idea that uh, the exclusion of design from nature um, I think, I think I'm just about out of time, so I don't want to belabor this point. Uh, uh, and uh, this is another point emphasizing the problem of natural selection. Uh, yeah, let me just skip over this. Oh, yeah. So I do want to mention, uh, uh, yeah, as I said, I, I just want to wrap this up. I do want to mention that even though I, I think it's a pretty strong case uh, that evolution and Christianity are, are awfully hard uh, to reconcile, and I think the creationists are not completely wrong uh, on that point, as, you know, as wrong as they are on so many other things, to think that there really is a fundamental conflict here. Uh, I think they have their point to make. But I do want to make it clear that there is another side to this. Uh, I'm not the best person to defend that other side since I don't believe it. But I will mention a few authors. Uh, Ken Miller is probably the most famous along these lines. Uh, and his book, Finding Darwin's God, is it's a really excellent book, but it's a very weird experience for someone reading it from, my, you know, from the perspective of, uh, of an atheist like me. The first half of the book is all about science and biology. Uh, Ken Miller is a biology professor at Brown University. And the first half of the book is all about uh, you know, the science of evolution and why creationism, creationism and Intelligent design is wrong, and it's wonderful stuff. Miller is a terrific writer, uh, and you'll really enjoy reading his, his work, even if you disagree with him. Uh, his, his prose is so good that you'll enjoy uh, you know, reading him anyway. But then somewhere around the middle of the book, he starts talking about religion and why. And he's a pretty, I mean, he's a pretty devout Roman Catholic, and he starts talking about religious topics. And from my perspective, it's like, yeah, wait a minute, where, where's the guy who wrote the first part of the book? I like that. Uh, but but he, you know, as strongly as I disagree with his religious views, he's a very good advocate for for what he believes, and uh, that, that that's just an excellent book that, that, that you should read. Uh, I'm less impressed with this one. Uh, this is from a philosopher named Michael Ruse, who is himself an atheist. Uh, but he wrote a book called Can a Darwinian Be a Christian? Uh, it's worth knowing about since it's an especially well-known book in this area. I gotta tell you though, this was the book that really made me start thinking seriously that evolution and Christianity couldn't be reconciled. 
uh, before God, which was not the intention of the book. Uh, before I read it, I, I, I didn't really think much about, uh, you know, I, I was more interested in learning the science. I didn't really care much about uh, the religious aspect. And this was one of the first books I read. You know, I, I just, I knew that, you know, the creations were out there with all their Bible thumping and whatnot. And I knew there were plenty of moderate, reasonable Christians who had no trouble accepting evolution. And that was good enough for me. And then I read his book, and what Bruce did uh, was he spells out all these different uh, objections uh, to you know, religion, you know, places where evolution and religion conflict. Some of them, the ones I mentioned, uh, and a few others that I didn't. And I was like, yeah, wow, gee, those are really good points. And then he put, provides the counter argument that's supposed to show that the conflict is only illusory and actually Chris is going coming. And in that case, I didn't find any of his replies you know, uh, very convincing. So you know, the effect is he pointed out all sorts of ways that evolution and religion conflict that I hadn't thought about before, and, uh, but didn't provide any effective answer to them. So I'm not a big fan of this book, but it is a fairly well-known one, uh, so you can give it a try if you want. Um, uh, John Howes is a very well-known uh, Catholic theologian. Uh, he's written a whole slew of books. I picked this one at random, but pretty much any of his books uh, present a very interesting. Now he has sort of a, a theologically liberal take on Catholicism uh, that a lot of like a lot of Catholics think he's. You know, I don't know if they actually consider him heretical, but they definitely consider him outside the mainstream. Uh, but he's worth reading just for that point. Uh, now again, I'm not a big fan of his arguments, I, and I'm not a big fan of his writing either. Uh, but but he, see, he is a well-known guy, and, I, and it's, it's probably worth reading a few of his books uh, just to get a yellow. You know, a, you know he, he defends his view very eloquently. And another one, uh, now it's interesting, Miller and House are Roman Catholics. This fellow, Keith Miller, you can't probably read that, but that's Keith Miller. Uh, I knew him. Uh, he was a, he's a geologist at Kansas State University. I met him when I was there. Very nice guy. And he wrote this book, Perspectives on an Evolving Creation. That's actually uh, an edited anthology. And that's interesting because that's written from an evangelical perspective. See, the Catholics historically have not had as much of a problem with evolution. They haven't been too crazy about it. But uh, you know, officially, it's not heretical, and uh, they're allowed to accept it. It's the evangelicals who are really hardcore. And uh, so the fact that Keith Miller is himself uh, you know, quite a devout evangelical Protestant, uh, it's interesting that uh, uh, you know, he, he wrote this book as well. A little harder to find a copy of this one, but uh, well worth it. But that brings me to the final and most important slide of them all. By my book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, uh, yeah, so this is just the tip of the iceberg, and, and uh, the book has a lot of uh, anecdotes of my experiences and, and much more thorough discussions of the points that I raised very quickly here. So thank you for your attention, and uh, that, that's it.